free interfaces, like the interface between air and water, movement response to external stimuli. If we were to touch the surface of water, we would see waves ripple out in a circle. Similarly, if we look at the ocean, we can see that the wind causes waves to form, and if we watch a beach, those waves crash on the beach. If we look at a river or near a dam, the irregular structure or the irregular river floor causes waves to be formed. A hydraulic jump, which you see here, is a region of flow where the height of the water jumps suddenly. Hydraulic jumps are cool because they can let you do fun things. For example, you can surf on a wave like this. But it can also be very dangerous because the flows associated with a hydraulic jump can lead to drowning hazards for people who are swimming on the backside, for example, of a dam. Hydraulic jumps are pretty common, and you can generate one in your sink just by running the faucet on the flat bottom of your sink. Hydraulic jumps are also very interesting because they're a case where an integral conservation analysis of mass and momentum allows us to predict whether this phenomenon will happen and how much of a height change happens when it occurs. channel to generate a hydraulic jump. A pump is filling a reservoir upstream, and that's issuing through a sluice gate into this channel. The flow is moving fast with a low height, it goes through a hydraulic jump, at which point it's moving slowly with a larger height, and that then issues off the end. The water here, if this were a dam, we would refer to as the tail water. This is a free surface flow, which means that the surface of this flow effectively has no shear stress. The reason for that is that the viscosity of the water is about a thousand times larger than the viscosity of the air. And that means as far as the water is concerned, the air effectively has no viscosity. The approximations associated with a free surface flow are actually quite similar to that of a free jet. Now this flow has a hydraulic jump. And the thing that's causing this hydraulic jump is this small weir that's been installed at the end of the tail water. This weir is blocking the fluid and making the fluid increase in height. In fact, a dam and a weir are essentially the same thing. A dam is a structure that blocks water where the water is not designed to go over it. This is what the flow looks like with no weir. We see a shallow stream of water issuing through the system and coming out the end. If I block that with this weir, we'll see a number of things happen. This weir blocks the flow and causes it to build up. We see a hydraulic jump that's formed and in this case moves all the way upstream, all the way to the sluice gate. And in fact, if we let this run long enough, this system would just fill up like it was a bathtub and the water would spill over. That system would have no hydraulic jump. Now we take the same flow and we block it with a weir that isn't quite as deep. We find that something slightly different happens. When I install this weir, Again, I block the flow, so the flow has to get deeper, and a hydraulic jump propagates upstream. What's different about this case is that this hydraulic jump doesn't propagate all the way up to the sluice gate, but instead stops at this point. So we're going to study this flow in terms of the integral conservation equations. And this, this flow actually is really cool because integral conservation equations that aren't that hard to analyze will actually explain to us how this height changes, why it changes, and by how much it changes. We'll study this system with some approximations. First of all, we'll assume that the flow both upstream and downstream of the hydraulic jump is uniform. And that's not quite right. Actually, the water's motionless at the walls, and there's a thin boundary layer where the fluid is moving more slowly. But we'll take that as an approximation. We'll do an integral, inviscid, 1D conservation analysis by taking this approximation that the velocity is uniform. And that will allow us to determine what happens at this hydraulic jump. If we look anywhere in this flow, anywhere upstream to downstream, we can show that the mass flux at any point is given by the density times the cross-sectional area times the speed of the fluid. We can do an integral conservation of mass analysis by judiciously choosing a control volume that we'll use to analyze this system. And we typically do that by taking a vertical plane upstream of the flow, a vertical plane downstream of the flow, and then the top and the bottom of the water as the delineation of that control line. If we do a conservation of mass analysis on that system, what we can show 
is that the amount of mass entering across the upstream plane must be equal to the amount of mass leaving on the downstream plane. We ignore the top and bottom planes because no mass is crossing those interfaces. The conservation of mass analysis shows us that the same amount coming in must be the same as the amount of mass going out. And what that tells us is that when the height is very shallow, like we see upstream, the fluid must be moving quickly. When the height is deep, as we see downstream, now the fluid must be moving more slowly. And so this conservation of mass tells us that the speed times the height must be a constant throughout this flow. You can see in this system that because the height of this flow has increased by approximately a factor of four, we could infer that the speed of this fluid upstream must be about four times as fast as this fluid downstream. So conservation of mass places a constraint on this system. It tells us as the fluid gets deeper, it must slow down. But it doesn't tell us that the fluid gets deeper, or by how much. We can learn more about this system if we consider X momentum. The same integral conservation analysis where we draw an upstream line here, a downstream line there, and consider the top and bottom of this fluid flow, tells us that if we keep track of the momentum flux leaving, and we compare that to the momentum flux entering, that any difference between these two has to be because of the application of some force in the x direction. If we calculate the momentum flux in this system, that's relatively straightforward. It's actually just equal to the mass flux that's entering multiplied by the speed. So that's straightforward. But the force is a little bit more complicated. We have two forces in this system if we assume that it's missing. There's a gravitational force that's being applied, and that we can ignore because it points in the z direction. But we also have a pressure force so if we draw a control volume from here to here and with the top and bottom of the water, we'll find that pressure is applying a force all the way around the entire circumference. And in addition, because the hydrostatic equation tells us that the pressure at the bottom of this water must be higher than the pressure at the top, that means that the magnitude of the pressure that's being applied varies throughout this system. Now, when we did the conservation of mass analysis, if we simply said, well, the surface of the water is what we'll define as the top of the, our control volume, that worked out very conveniently for mass because no mass crossed that surface. But when we go to calculate the forces, we have a problem, and that's that we have a shape of a top surface that we don't know yet, and we somehow need to do the vector integral of the pressure around this entire surface. And so we need to use a trick to simplify that approach. So the trick that we play is that we if we look at any control volume and we integrate around that entire control volume, if we have a uniform pressure that's being applied around the entire surface, that net force is zero. And that means we can add to or subtract away any uniform pressure from the system. So what we do in this system is we subtract away the atmospheric pressure. So we subtract away the atmospheric pressure from the top, the atmospheric pressure from the sides, the atmospheric pressure from the bottom, atmospheric pressure from the upstream face. And what that means is that the one surface that we don't know anything about, which is the shape of the water at the top, actually has zero pressure. And so the one place where we don't know what its shape is is the one place where we don't have to perform the integral. What we're left with, then, is a pressure force at the bottom that's pointing straight up in the z direction that we don't need to factor into the x-momentum equations. And on the upstream and on the downstream faces, we have pressures that are pushing in on the system with magnitudes that vary vertically because of the hydrostatic and that's something that we can integrate straightforward. By integrating the x component of the force that comes from the pressure distribution, we now also get an expression that tells, gives us conservation of momentum throughout this control volume. So the conservation of mass and conservation of x momentum equations now give us two equations and two unknowns. We know what the speed is upstream and we know what the height is upstream, but we don't know what the speed or height are this flow are downstream. And so H2 and U2 are unknowns in this system. And we have two equations that specify that, conservation of mass and conservation of momentum. If we work through the algebra, we'll find that we get two different solutions. One solution is that we draw a control volume, and we find that the speed is the same on the inlet and the outlet, and the height is the same at the inlet and the outlet. And that's what would happen if we drew a control volume right here. The speed here and here are the same, the height here and here are the same. That's consistent with the governing equations. If we drew a control volume here, again, we would see the speed here and the speed here are the same, the height here and the height here are the same. So that's one solution. The other possible solution that comes from these two equations and two unknowns 
is that the height changes by a prescribed amount and that the speed changes by a prescribed amount to balance conservation of mass. And so what the combination of these two conservation equations tell us is that when we look at flow moving downstream, the height of a river typically stays the same. We don't see any dramatic changes, but every once in a while, we'll get boundary conditions that will allow for the other solution. And the other solution is for the fluid to jump up with a concomitant slowing down of the speed of the fluid. Now the dynamics of this flow are a function of what's called the Froude number. And the Froude number is the ratio of two different speeds in the system. One speed, u, is the speed with which this fluid upstream is moving. And the second speed, the speed of a gravity wave, or the square root of g times h, prescribes the speed with which a ripple would move if we took water and we just touched it on the surface. When the Froude number is below one, that means that this fluid is moving slow relative to the speed with which a wave moves. A fruit number below one describes a system like this, where it looks like we're basically just filling up a bathtub until it spills out. And that's what happens when the water is deep enough that the speed of gravity waves is high, faster than the speed of the fluid rushing in. If we look at a system like this, this system corresponds to a fruit number larger than one, where the speed with which the fluid is moving through the system is faster than the speed with which a gravity wave moves. Or in other words, the speed with which, if I touch the surface, a ripple would move out. When I add a weir to this system, what I'm doing is I'm ch dynamically changing the speed of the gravity waves. When I insert a weir into the end, this fluid will start to pile up. As its height gets bigger and bigger, the speed of the gravity waves gets faster and faster. Once the gravity waves in the tailwater are fast enough to push up, you see a wave propagate upstream. When we create a stable hydraulic jump, it's because we have a region downstream in the tailwater where the water is deep, and the speed of the gravity waves is fast, that can push upstream. Meanwhile, upstream of the hydraulic jump, we have a shallow water where the speed of the gravity waves is slow and all of the water is being carried downstream. So dynamically, when I insert this weir into the system, not only do we see the hydraulic jump moving upstream, but what you're also seeing is the propagation of changes in the speed of the surface waves. Up here, the surface waves are slow, down here, the surface waves are fast. This hydraulic jump is the point at which all the waves collide with each other. The surface waves that are moving forward faster than the downstream flow, and the surface waves up here that are crashing forward. When all these waves crash forward together, they create this discontinuity that we refer to as a hydraulic jump. Whether we get a stable hydraulic jump in a system like this is basically a function of how strong my pump is and how tall my weir is. If I, wake my, if I make my weir very deep, the water builds up until it's very deep, the gravity waves get very fast, so fast that all of the gravity waves dominate, the water fills up and the wave moves all the way up to the sluice gate. Again, this system now starts to look like a bathtub that we're just filling up and where it eventually will spill out over in the back. If on the other hand, I use a pump and the pump is very weak, then the flow here will be very slow Again, the gravity waves will be faster than the incoming flow, and the system will just fill up like a bathtub. On the other hand, if I want to have a hydraulic jump, what I need is a pump that's strong enough that brings this fluid in quickly, and I need a weir that's shallow enough that the speed of the gravity waves here never becomes big enough to push this hydraulic jump all the way up to the sluice gate. Now, I can make a slightly different flow if I make this weir just a little bit deeper. If I take this one out and I add one I'll again create a hydraulic jump. And we can watch this hydraulic jump move upstream until we get at the sluice state what we would call a submerged hydraulic jump. And what that means is that this flow hasn't become so simple that we're just filling it up like a bathtub. But now the hydraulic jump is basically e existing just downstream of the sluice state. And one of the reasons why this is important is that this can be common at the back end of a dam. And for people who swim on the back end of dams, this can cause a drowning hazard. So what you'll find with this flow is that there's actually a hydraulic jump shooting through here and jumping up, but then there's a recirculatory flow that fills things in. That means that if you are located in this flow here, or here, or here, the top of this flow is actually moving back towards the dam. The reason why this makes a drowning hazard is because it means that someone who is swimming in this region would be pulled back towards the dam and then eventually can be pulled down underwater. Now we can demonstrate this phenomenon by taking a ping pong ball 
and dropping it into the system. When we drop this ping pong ball, we'll see that it doesn't move downstream, but instead moves upstream toward the sluice gate. And that's through a considerable distance. Uh, as we move downstream from the sluice gate, we'll still see that the top of this fluid flow is actually moving backwards, moving upstream. Hey, Patrick, actually, can we cut it here? And instead of showing the demonstration, maybe what we should do is instead we should show the demo that uh, Grady Hillhouse does. He's got a little piece of wood, and the little piece of wood is cool because he drops it and then he shows that it actually gets caught under, which would be a good, um, a good simulation of the drowning. Actually, no, what's, what's better, there's this awesome video from the UK. There's this like public service announcement where this fireman has a setup a little bit like this, and he sends these little figurines over this model here, and then they show the little people like getting pulled underneath the water over and over and over again. Then actually the guy like pulls out the figurine and says like, what if this person's swimming away? And then he drops it down and he shows that the system pulls it back in. And then it gets even darker because then it cuts in and they show this zoom in of these people getting like washing machined over and over again underneath the water. I think that would be funny. Now the hydraulic jumps in this setup reproduces the hydraulic jumps that you can see in a lot of natural systems. Downstream of a dam or in a river. And they're interesting because they can be stable locations where either a person who's like surfing or trash or residue can build up at the stable location at the generation of this wave. It also can be kind of dark because this stable location can also be a place where people end up drowning. So there are other kinds of hydraulic jumps. For example, it's pretty easy to make a hydraulic jump in your sink by turning on the faucet and having that water issue onto the flat surface of the bottom. Now that hydraulic jump is actually different in a number of different ways. That jump comes from a flow that's so shallow that actually surface tension is relatively important. It's also true that that jump is axially symmetric. And because of the axial symmetry, that jump is much more difficult to study analytically. So a hydraulic jump is a free surface flow in which a fast moving shallow water jumps, increases its height, and slows down. It can be cool and fun because it's a, a place where you can surf. It can be dangerous because it's a place where you drown. Understanding hydraulic jumps is actually a very important part of dam and spillway design because of the hazards for people and also the hazards for equipment associated with this flow. And it's also a place where a 1D inviscid integral conservation analysis gets you a quantitative prediction about what happens. It's also one where a judicious choice of a control volume allows you to take a complicated analysis with vector surface integrals and turn them into a relatively straightforward analysis with algebra and just a little bit of calculus.